This is a Founded Media podcast. Welcome back to From Tanks to Teleportation, a podcast where we explore the intersection of technology, business, and national security with leaders of the Defense Innovation Unit, which is part of the U.S. Department of Defense. I'm your host, Dan Dillard, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Zach Walker, the Texas lead for the DIU. Today, we have a very special guest on our show, the man, the myth, the legend, Jamie Heineman. You probably know him from his work as a special effects expert on the TV show Mythbusters. But there is so much more to him than that. In this episode, we dive into his history, which has ranged from being a chef to boat captain and even a pet store owner. We also hear from Jamie about where he thinks the future of defense technology is heading and how he thinks the private and public sectors need to get better at working together. Today, it's blowing stuff up for defense innovation. Let's get to our conversation. Jamie, thanks so much for being with us today. So while most people know you for some of the notable work that you've done, I'm really intrigued to talk to you about and learn more about your background, the work that people may not know about. As I was looking into some of your backstory, I was blown away by some of the things that you've done, what I was learning from hitchhiking as a kid all over the country to having a degree in Russian linguistics to honorary doctorates to, that you received. I mean, just wow. Then I, I read about your career uh, when you're going to from boat captain to survival expert to chef and everything in between. Well, um, I grew up in the Midwest and uh, uh, my parents were of a somewhat... Uh, I don't know, conventional background. And uh, in the Midwest, that means uh, do what you're told and don't talk back. Um, and they had issues with me not paying attention to that. And uh, it was in the 60s and, you know, hippies and a uh, long hair and, uh, you know, VW vans uh, painted with flowers and lots of pot and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, <laughs> it, it sort of was um, formative for a lot of stuff that happened later. Uh, my mother, being a librarian, uh, did her homework and she looked around. She found a, a survival training uh, school in Wyoming and uh, uh, and they said, uh, you make it through this, uh, you know, the next time you want to take off for the summer, uh, we'll at least know that you have some official kind of ability to take care of yourself. And, well, uh, and by the way, you, you take the family car this time. So, Jamie, it's a huge pleasure to have you on From Tanks to Teleportation. If you could talk a bit more about how you went from that pretty remarkable background to getting into special effects and getting into this love of experimentation and, and science and the technology that we all know about you today. So I made lists. I researched it. I went to the library. These were days before the Internet. And, you know, uh, put assigned pluses and minuses to all potential choices that I had. And, uh, um, and I found just purely artificially that way that uh, uh, effects was the choice for me because it was creative, uh, but creative over a wide potential range of different types of things. Um, it had a, 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 a lot of reach, like if you were wanting to do creative stuff, let's say you're going to be a sculptor, what are you going to do? Put it on a, make a sculpture and set it on a, you know, stump on the next to a wall or something or uh, you know, it's like if you're making movies, uh, millions and millions of people may see them. And uh, so you're working with a wide variety of different uh, um, situations and people. It was uh, uh, it just ticked off all the boxes. It wasn't routine oriented. Um, and by the way, I, uh, uh, um, you know, one of the things that you didn't mention was that right after high school, I had bought a pet store. Uh, my father had come home with a dog collar for the dog and found that the pet store, local pet store was up for sale. And uh, I had a little inheritance, uh, you know, a few thousand dollars from uh, my um, mother having died uh, just before that. And so I bought that pet store and uh, uh, and I uh, eventually I learned that uh I didn't like routines, you know, it was like you never in that kind of thing, you never get away from it. You got all these animals, you know, pissing and shitting and, and killing each other and dying and, you know, it just uh, you can't leave it alone. So uh, I stayed with that for three years uh, and had decided to, do, to go to college to so that I didn't have to, you know, work for a living. 
<laughs> or the equivalent of that because I didn't like my experience with, uh, you know, running a small business. But um, uh, that uh, jumping to filmmaking, uh, uh, being able to have a flexible routine or, or a flexible way of living that wasn't routine oriented uh, was what I thrived on. And uh, uh, that's what I wanted. So I got into film effects work, same drill, made lists, was methodical about it, started out cleaning, you know, shops because I was handy and didn't, you know, and hardworking and uh, uh, shortly had my own shop uh, because I kind of, I don't know, I, I, I had learned, you know, this, this is actually another funny little story that goes towards um, how I approach things. Um, uh, I had reasoned that if I cleaned the, the shop, I would be the one that knew where everything was. And so that's a position of power. <laughs> um, so, cause if, if the people there had to rely on you, uh, uh, to, to be able to do their job because they couldn't find anything, if you weren't there, then, um, that's job security. And, uh, so I, uh, you know, uh, found all the work that I wanted that way. Uh, and uh, when these, these, these special effects shops tend to come and go because it's a, it's an unreliable business, you know, you're living or working from job to job and, uh, and laying everybody off and rehiring. They tend to get a, a, a little success from a movie here or there or something that lasts for a few years and then they go away. Um, and, uh, so I, uh, my shop now is actually a kind of a composite of close to half a dozen of those shops that um, eventually went away. Um, and I got, the, I, I would, you know, I got their stuff, either bought it or was given to it because they didn't want it. And, um, and I managed to uh, um, stay, uh, stay in business for long enough by doing prototypes like toy prototypes and other kinds of prototypes, as well as film effects worth any work, anything I could do to get my hands on. And I kept my uh, overhead down and uh, diversified that way. Uh, the diversification actually in that environment was what led to landing Mythbusters because as unlikely as it seemed at the time that I would be able to, uh, you know, have a successful TV show, uh, I took it on just as a matter of principle because small businesses need to diversify if they're going to have any longevity. And, uh, sure enough, this landed, uh, you know, it was one in a million shot, but, uh, um, uh, that kind of saved me from going the way of computer graphics, uh, which is what all special effects virtually is now. Yeah. Yeah, um, for sure. Yes. There's probably, all, I'm, well, I know, I'm sure there's a lot of really creative work that is being done and is going on in their heads, but, uh, what are they doing? They're sitting, staring at a monitor. And, yeah, it's not physical. It's not out there experiencing it. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. It's, uh, you know, there's there's something to be said for, uh, I mean, we, we were inundated with all this technology, but I always uh, remember that, you know, the, we, regardless of who we are, we live in the real world. We still have to eat. Uh, we still have to have a roof over our head and, and uh, interact, uh, hopefully interact with other people and stuff like that. So there's, there's more in the world than what you see on a TV screen. I see the thread uh, of the not wanting to like get in one compartment and just do all these various things and how that's led you down the path. I want to talk about the DIU and how you started working with the DOD and how, you know, some of the experiences, one of the things that one of the program managers over at DIU had said about you is he's a true experimenter, prototyper, here's a problem and now we need to go solve it. You go out and, and, and future it out, not just theorize it and you make it happen. So why is it important to get it off the computer and out of the lab and just go test things? Will you talk about some of the projects that you've seen with the work that you've done with DOD? Well, um, the thing that happened to me over all of this, uh, all these various experiences, which were uh, initially all over the map, but then as I got into the effects, I'd found my niche, as it were, and I stayed with that for decades. Uh, and then Mythbusters came along and... I ended up with the ability to make it pretty much anything. You know, it was almost like CG magic, where if I have the idea, I go in my shop and I have the thing. It's just a matter of time. 
I had had a good experience a, a couple of times working with the government throughout throughout MythBusters and uh, uh, ended up doing uh, um, some work for one of the three letter agencies and and uh, you know it's no, nothing uh, um, you know no spy craft or anything like that is more uh, concealment and delivery de- devices let's say that were relatively innocuous I didn't even know, I didn't need to know what they were for but I enjoyed the work and. Uh, one thing led to another, and I uh, uh, ended up uh, 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 getting invited to go do some exercises with uh, uh, with uh, some of the elite military people, and um, uh, and so what I, w- I would go out with them and see what they were doing and uh, ask them questions about you know is it. Uh, are the things that you are you don't like about this work, or stuff that you know ought to be uh, changed, in, in terms of the you know the technology or whatever you know physical things, uh, and uh, and and several times I found uh, that oh well I can take care of that, uh, and I would go back to my shop and make something, and you know. I, uh, uh, and, you know, Bob's your uncle where uh, they, they I, I became somewhat uh, or fairly successful. I did some work with them that they uh, um, that they thought was uh, was good and has uh, things that have moved on from there. Um, the first one, I think, with that was something that um, the these guys, if they end up having to board a ship, let's say it's in the middle of the night in open ocean. They have a long pole that has a grappling hook on it that they send up, and they may well be out in open seas uh, that are, you know, that mean that every couple of seconds the boat and them are airborne. Now, a ship uh, can be a hundred feet tall with no, uh, uh, and, you know, no uh, kind of decks or anything that you can hook that hook onto, and so on. So. Uh, it's a dangerous thing. It's something really awkward. They've got to come up, climb up a little caving ladder, and they're, uh, uh, you know, heavily laden with their gear. And uh, you know, it might be a piracy situation, so they're, they're they've got to be on their guard for getting shot at or something. And so, I made this thing, which carries them. It's the size of a small suitcase, and it carries them straight up at about a mile and a half an hour. Uh, it has uh, little tank treads. Uh, on it that are magnets with rubber pads on them. Uh, and uh, we've carried a couple of guys straight up the side of a ship. It's terrifying because you're entirely reliant on this thing. And, you know, you could fall 100 feet right onto the deck of that, that uh, you know, go fast boat that you come off of uh, or get, you know, or drown or something. But um, uh, we found we never saw it actually break free. Sometimes they slide, you know, with uh, uh, if there's a... Uh, uh, salt crystals or something like that on it, or, or a bump, and so we, uh, um, uh, it's it's uh, continuing in development. Uh, I did the prototype, and that was a situation that, you know, uh, uh, it was just, uh, well, what what you know, this this doesn't seem like a a, a reasonable thing to to do, you know, and so, and so uh, I had. Uh, and you know what's funny about that, and this is also telling about my mindset, is that that goes back to a thought experiment that I had wondered about it uh, earlier, which was that, well, if, if you have a magnet and you hook it onto a steel ceiling, if you weigh 200 pounds, the magnet's got to have more than 200 pounds of pull if you're going to hang on it. How much magnetic pull do you have to have if uh, it's on a vertical surface. And if you put a non-skid material between it and that surface, and it turns out I can support 200 pounds with 30 pounds of pull with that. Um, and so, uh, the thing that, that I built actually is theoretically capable of holding, you know, close to a thousand pounds or something like that, because why not? It, and it's just that much more security. Um, it's there, there, there are issues like salt crystals and uneven surfaces and things like that, which we, uh, have addressed, but, um, uh, that was a, a perfect little gadget for me. Somebody had tried it before, apparently, uh, years before me. And I don't know what the problem was, but, uh, it took several guys to move this thing onto the side of the ship and it didn't, you know, it wasn't that reliable or something like that. I spent a month and a half by myself, uh, in the shop with the music cranked up. 
And uh, I was just, you know, partying with this thing and it come out, uh, it works. We took it over to a, a nearby ship in San Francisco Bay, a military ship and told the guys what I was doing. And they said, sure, let's, uh, let's try it out. And we even, uh, uh, you know, got some seawater and put some dishwashing soap in it to make it nice and slippery and mop down the wall and still had a, a, a couple of operators there with me that just, they just, one of them got on it, went straight up. So the other one hung on to him and they both ran up. So it's a little, that, uh, that thing was a beast. Could you speak a bit about the, um, some of the other work, some of the counter drone work, the H wing, that's some really interesting stuff too. Well, drones maneuver by uh, changing the rotation of props so that they like they'll slow down this one, so that drops and off they go in that direction. Um, well, that means that for them to change direction, they've got to move all that mass. Now, a little drone can just and and it's and it's gone. Big drone, not so much. You'll see they're they're kind of move and that's the way it works. Well, so I thought about that, and uh, that meant to me that I need to, to tip the balance. I need to make up for that extra mass by having vectored thrust. So uh, all of the props, like I, the, the H-Wing was a, uh, a, a, a quadcopter as well, uh, but all four of the props were on servo, so they could be tilted, um, as well as... Um, they were on uh, they were on wings so we had now we had a uh, um, had a, a drone with this was four wings uh, tandem wing design two in the front two in the back and uh, and so it takes off with the wings vertical uh, so it does the V tall thing like your standard quadcopter but then when it gets airborne it tips the wings and and off they go uh, and so now we have much greater range because we're using the lift of the wings greater speed. Um, and we made the, uh, the props fully blown, uh, meaning the, the diameter of the, uh, of the blades on the motors were the same as the width of a wing or the length of a wing. Uh, and this thing is arguably the most agile aircraft ever designed. I mean, there's, you have an Osprey that does that, but you know, it's with two wings and it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's a big thing and it's not made to, you know, do aerobatics and stuff like that. This thing was, um, the, we built everything, uh, uh, out of heavy, heavy duty carbon fiber, uh, tubing and whatnot and, uh, and structures that we made in, on it to reinforce it. Uh, it can come in at a hundred miles an hour with the wings like this and go like that and stop like air brakes. Um, it can do, uh, you know, barrel rolls and maneuvers like, you know, so that are so aggressive. Uh, it's, it's yaw authority is so aggressive that, um, you need the autonomy because it's too agile for a human to control it. Um, at, at least at, it, at its, uh, upper limits of its performance. Uh, I've looked at my work with the military as something that's, you know, not only patriotic, but also, uh, uh, you know, by and large, uh, is making stuff that keep our side safe. You know, uh, testing and prototyping is what, what you described is key to finding out what's possible. You know, many organizations uh, that work with the DOD, they stick with the pen and paper and they propose technology solutions that way. So in your opinion, what's, what things need to change to be more effective and efficient in bringing technology to the government? I think that's one of the things about DIU is that, uh, that they, uh, uh, they will work towards uh, uh, negotiating about that if that's what they feel like will make for a more successful product and, and incentivize people. Because I think that's a lot of what DIU is about is to uh, try and find ways of, uh, of, of uh, uh, keeping the, the, the defense up to date and, and, you know, whatever it takes, as long as it's ethical, uh, let, let's figure it out and, and, you know, stay, stay with uh, our near peers and, and others like that, that maybe don't have some of the same constrictions that we do. Yeah. You're spot on, Jamie. We learned pretty early on that to really get the best technology, we can't own it, right? We have to make sure the companies have the ability to commercialize it and market it and, and frankly profit on it. And that's really the the key of being, being dual use. 
Uh, but there are many cases where, like you mentioned earlier, if it's something that is research and development done with the government, yeah, certainly the government does assert some kind of rights. But we, we really try to make it as negotiable as possible. If a company wants to just let the government use it, great. If the company wants the government to own part of it, let's work it out as well. Um, but something else that we do that is somewhat unique is the access to ranges and testing that may be different than what you would get on the private side. A lot of our portfolio companies have said that they've really enjoyed being able to get really quick feedback from DUD and honestly, frankly, just kind of blow stuff up in ways that the FAA may not normally let you do. I was curious if you could speak a bit about blowing stuff up for the government, literally, but also figuratively, right? The good, the bad, the ugly, you know, anything that, that you would want our audience to know. Um, sure. Well, uh, first up, the uh, the whole thing about blowing stuff up was it's it's what we got known for. But um, the reality of it is that it's kind of boring. I mean, uh, first the thing is there, and then it's not there anymore. And you know, uh, it, we only really got to enjoy what was going on by using the high speed camera afterwards, uh, and, you know, and inspecting the shrapnel or something like that. But um, uh, other than it's not something that uh, you see all the time, hopefully, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's not that exciting for, for me. I, I have not done any, uh, blowing stuff up for, uh, DIU. I did do some for the office of naval research and developing a new type of, of, uh, lightweight armor that was specifically designed to deal with, uh, a blast pressure reduction. So we used geometry to, uh, in the, in the structure of the, of the material, these blast panels to try to reflect and redirect at right angles instead of, you know, using brute force to absorb stuff, which means mass and weight. Um, the, there is a, a, a funny story about that as it, I used some of the resources that we had um, from uh, uh, the uh, uh, in, in the Bay Area uh, with law enforcement at a blast range where we could, you know, legally set, set off some explosives to test this armor. And, uh, uh, to control it, I, uh, got a trench plate, those heavy steel plates, they're like an inch thick or something go on the road to cover up holes that have been excavated for, you know, uh, work on the roads. And, uh, I suspended that on a, uh, on the tines of, uh, of an extended reach forklift, like a great all. And I mounted this test sample of, of uh, armor on the underside, and we suspended uh, the uh, this whole affair over the required thing by the ONR that the test would be uh, a kilo of TNT at ten inches. And we set this thing off, and you know uh, these things off in different configurations of of the prototypes that I made, um, and you know the whole thing would you know obviously. Uh, it, it affected the trench plate <laughs> um, because, and it, you know, it, as you would expect, you know, the, the explosive goes off and the trench plates kind of, you know, propelled upward a little bit and, uh, and the group and the, uh, the extended reach forklift is, you know, bounced some, uh, but it had its arm extended. It was fine. However, over, I don't know, about uh, close to 10 tries, the trench plate, uh, potato chipped. And, uh, so it became like this where the, you know, cause from the blast hitting it in the middle over and over again, we bolt on our next sample and do it again. And so I was like, uh Oh, I'm going to have to buy a trench plate. It looks like we went until we had about used up the, all the explosives. And I said, well, let's turn it upside down and put the rest of the explosives underneath it. See if we can straighten that sucker out. <laughs> and, and it did. Oh, wow. <laughs> Except cool. the, the, uh, so the poor rental, you know, trench plate company is like, I, I imagine they're going to be looking at that. There's a, a little bit of a kind of a n nicely shaped, shallow bowl shape right in the middle of it and be like, <laughs> what on earth could do that? Do you ever look back? I mean, you've, got, you've done so many things. You ever look back on your career and, and, and have actually something that stands out for you? I see that as like I see a lot of what I've experienced in my life has been kind of like surfing. Uh, so you never really know where you're going to end up. You know, there is the is, uh, reality to pay 
do all due respect to the, you know, you're not going to fight the ocean. You're not going to change what those waves do. Uh, you're going to have to follow them, but where you actually go with them is, uh, is up to you. And so this, uh, rather unusual background that I've had is a good example of that. And I'm still seeing that, uh, in the way that, uh, you know, people that have seen me and, and reach out to me, there's been just so many opportunities and interesting things have been, that have been happening. You mentioned, uh, M5 or uh, your company, is that what led you to create that or what does M5 do? Uh, well, M5 was a special effects and prototyping company, and okay. we got taken over by uh, MythBusters for a while. Uh, as I mentioned, it was fortunate because we were we had our niche, but uh, computer graphics has slowly come to dominate everything, so it makes it hard to uh, 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 make a reliable living doing the, what we call practical effects. But uh, the shop, as it happens, because we were the place that you would go to uh, when, uh, if you were a director or producer and you didn't know where else to go to have something made, it was like, whatever it is, uh, if that director wants a thing, he can come to me. And if I don't know how to make it myself, I know who does or, or know how to find who does. And, uh, and so we have all this equipment to be able to expedite that kind of stuff. It's n nothing particularly exotic, but it's, uh, it's varied and versatile and, uh, and designed to, all designed to put something together, together really quickly. Basically, if I have an idea, I just uh, go in that shop, crank the music, lock the door. I'm coming out with a thing sooner or later. I kind of think you have to leave it to uh, people like me or some or, you know, somehow engage them. We, we live in the real world and um, problem solving uh, 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 can greatly benefit by interacting with the real world. That's where these prototypes, rap rapid prototyping and stuff like in the shop uh, that I have, it, like you start to pull stuff off of shelves, you cut cut it up, you screw something onto it, you glue this or uh, assemble that, and and it gets it in your head. You know, is otherwise, if you don't get it in your head, it's like a pile of meaningless data on the table. You need to internalize it because once you internalize it, then you become an active participant in solving the problem and, and, and making something uh, instead of a passive one. You can't just like think about something or stare at something and expect that uh, that all sorts of amazing things are going to happen. Well, I learned a lot today, and I'm sure many of our audience did as well, Jamie. Thank you so much for being with us and connecting the dots for us on your life, the experiences, your contributions. And I will say, and I'm sure Zach agrees with me, anytime you're in Austin, I'd love to blow some stuff up with you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, then. We, we appreciate you being here and to chat today. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good luck. Thanks, Jamie. Take care. Thanks again for sharing your thoughts, insights, and experiences, Jamie. We so enjoyed getting to learn a little bit more about you and what you're doing, as well as your unique path. Again, our offer still stands to get together to blow things up the next time you find yourself in Austin. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend or fellow myth-busting fanatic. And if you haven't already, be sure to listen to the previous episodes from Tanks to Subportation to learn more about the exciting work the Defense Innovation Unit is doing. And Tanks to Teleportation is in partnership between the Defense Innovation Unit and Founding Media. It's created in Austin, Texas. To learn more about the DIU, please visit our show notes. Thank you for listening.